Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Oh, yeah. You know, so the Oilers lost 4-3 to three in a real very tough loss. They now have three wins and six losses. They've out consistently uh, outchanced other teams in terms of grade-A chances. They did so again tonight, 14 and 13. But, Bruce, they've – and it was in many ways a good game and an interesting game and a fun game. But the Oilers are frustrating their fans, frustrating their coach. Um, they must be frustrated themselves because they, they're not winning and they – and the clock is ticking fast on a shortened season. Um, they lost the game on mistakes. Um, as far, you know, that's, the, I think, every goal against, let me just check this, every goal against seemed to be a pretty major mistake. Uh, mental errors, tactical errors um, that, uh, that cost them. Maybe the second goal against them, the power play, was kind of more of a bang bang kind of play. But um, the other three goals, there was it was there was haywire things about them, and this is the way the Oilers are losing the games this year. What was your take on the game? Well, I the first half of it I didn't find very enjoyable at all, frankly, and it got interesting. Once Edmonton made it two to one late in the second period. It got interesting, and the third was, you know, back and forth with the uh, Oilers twice managing to tie it up and twice managing to take a penalty within a minute of tying it up and twice failing to kill the penalty and falling right back behind again both times. So extremely frustrating. They, they, you know, when they tie the game, you know, that's the time you really want to sort of consolidate and just play some solid five-on-five five for a while, and they took a penalty on the next whistle both times. Very oh. frustrating, especially when the penalty kill is in the state of complete disarray that the Oilers is at the moment. Riley Shane was an underrated member of the team, Bruce. I, you know, I, I'm not on. I was never that on board with the Riley Shane is a terrible hockey player argument that we heard from some people. I thought that he, most of his even strength problems came playing with Jujar Kara, which was a bad line combination on the part of the coach and not, not necessarily on either of those players, although I think Kara is a much weaker player than Shane. But Riley Shane was just an outstanding penalty killer. And are they ever missing him, Bruce? They are missing him uh, as uh, on that penalty kill like you cannot imagine right now because it's pucks are going... Plays that he would have made, I feel, are not being made at the top of the um, defensive unit, the top of the defensive formation by the two forwards out there, and it's leading to all kinds of good shots for the other team. Bruce, this is our Two Good Things, Two Bad Things, and Two Numbers podcast. Do you have a good thing? Oh, yeah, i got a couple good things, but the one I'm going to pick is the play of Caleb Jones who I thought skated extremely well in this game. Like, we're really seeing his wheels for the first time uh, that, you know, in a standout kind of way where he was uh, jumping on pucks, moving pucks, uh, uh, involved in the play. Uh, when he was on the ice, the uh, Oilers had 17 shot attempts to just eight for the Leafs. So, you know, his pairing with Adam Larson was quite proactive, and he was a key part of that in terms of, of joining play from the defensive end, getting it going, going north. I know he chipped in on a couple of good scoring chances. Uh, unfortunately, his uh, uh, his night will probably be remembered by him not being in the shooting lane on the winning goal, where Austin Matthews was given a free pass to the back of the net from the uh, inside the faceoff circle because nobody got in the lane, including the goalie. Um, but he was just one got one of the players there you know so it's one of those things two steps forward one back but uh i think he made steps forward in this game he looked more like a solution than part of the problem in this game to my eye yeah i i kind of like the Oilers' defense i know they've been taking a lot of heat various players have larson and barry and that said i could see evan bouchard going in for tyson barry next game like if, if i'm completely honest i would i wouldn't be averse to making that move i might i if that's the obvious move as far as I'm concerned to make. Um, but that said, I, I, I thought I think their defense has played generally okay this year other than the first few games. 
uh, you know, where it was really ragged. But um, I always felt with Jones, like watching him early and in his chances early, like, and you see this with player after player, Bruce. We, we've seen it, Kara, Jujar Kara, most recently. They're so tentative. They're not. They're not really playing their best game because they look to me like they're lacking confidence. I and mean, I'm not in their heads, but that's how they look. They're hesitant on the ice. They're not really going for it. Or if they're going for it, they're a second too late going for it, and then they're a second too late, and they get punished for that. So that's what I noticed with Caleb Jones early in the year, and uh, I just feel like if you're going to fail in the NHL, if you're going to fail at anything, fail trying. You're giving it. You're going for it making up your mind you're just going to go for it and do your best and take a chance to make plays and take a chance to to be on top of things and be confident out there and um i think people can make up their mind to play that way and i think maybe jones just did could be a turning point for him as i've often said i've seen him as a player who's as as as, as good a player as ethan bear he hasn't shown that consistency at the NHL level yet that Ethan Bear has shown but I think that player's there and he and he took a huge step tonight I thought it was his best game by far I mean I think he's played five four or five oh, this and season yeah this season best best game this season he's played other really good games in the past but this season he just started out and looked like uh the the weight of expectation looked like it overwhelmed him and I guess and again I'm just imagining this I don't know what's going on inside the player or the person, but that's how it looked to me. So good to see him turn it around. My good thing, the third goal from the Oilers, uh, Bruce, so rarely has one of the bottom two lines come through this year that it's it's worth remarking when they do. And it was just a fantastic play, mainly by Adam Larson, I think. Mm -hmm. um, going for it. That's how you play hockey. You go for it. You, you just make up your mind. You will your way to win the puck. And he did that on that puck battle along the boards. He was he was he looked like he was going to lose it, but he just totally committed to that battle, and he won the battle and got the puck in there to Turris, who made a nice play. Kyle Turris made a nice play. Put it on hard on net, right at net. I think Kyle Turris has a bit of an offensive game. Um, Cassian tipped it and then roofed it so nice play by Cassian and, and Turris but I, I thought Adam Larson was was the the key player on that whole sequence um that line Bruce had a number of even strength chances I think James Neal is playing really well and he was in on a couple chances uh on the power play and even strength both kind of shot tips or redirections so to me that line has some promise and I think they should stick with it um what one of the things that's that's missing from the orders right now, I think, is just obvious chemistry in the lines. I'm not seeing any line that's that looks like they're in sync out there, that looks like they're really getting it together. I mean, the closest thing maybe is Dry Saddle Cahoon and Yamamoto, which kind of consistently gets a couple chances a game and maybe gives up one. But even they aren't aren't really dominating um the play as much as you would hope and, and finishing their plays Cahoon again, had a great chance and wasn't able to bury it. But the top line, other than the one game that they were together, no chemistry. And Pugliarvi tonight, I thought, had a really rough night. He he just seemed discombobulated and, you know, on a couple dump ins, he shot it into the bench. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, the third line got it done tonight, I thought, and uh, good good work by them, and they were rewarded with a goal. It all seemed like a big goal for a few seconds there before they took another penalty. <laughs> uh, Bruce, you're, you're steamed. I like it. Oh. I like it. You don't have to rat yet. If you if you want to rat, just rat. Just just unload. Just go. Just do it. But uh, or do you just want to tell me? Did have you? Have you? Did you just do your? Where am I? Where are we now? Bet your bad thing. My bad thing is all the right. first goal against gifted to <laughs> Toronto. Second home game in a row that Mikko Kostinen has gifted a goal to the other team to open the scoring in the first period. And this one was atrocious times three. Kostinen came out of the net to handle the puck, uh, passed it, tried to pass it to Tyson Barry, but it got intercepted. He scrambled back into the net, but he got his stick jammed in the back of the net so he wasn't able to get square to the shot because he jammed his own stick in the wrong spot. 
and then finally the shot itself was just kind of lobbed into the into his body and somehow he managed to let it leak through and into the net and it was just an ugly from a goaltender's point of view that was a triply ugly goal like, i was trying to just think a if, disaster of a goal yeah goal. i was trying to think bruce like do you think anyone like we didn't mark anyone else to blame on that goal and this is often the case when there's a heinous turnover an unexpected mm-hmm. turnover because everyone else is kind of mm-hmm. positioning themselves as if the easy pass the simple pass is going to be made the simple pass the safe pass for Koskinen, just dump it off the boards man don't don't try to it'd be tried to hit tyson barry it got picked off now you know i was thinking to barry do the wrong thing but no he's kind of flaring out like he should Koskinen has full possession of the puck he shouldn't be trying to cover for him in case he makes a turnover He's got to go. He's going to be heading towards the corner, is what he's thinking, because Koskinen's going to just dump it in the corner. So I didn't yeah. can't blame Tyson Barry. And then the then after the turnover, it all happened so fast mm-hmm. that McDavid doesn't have a chance to make the. No one ha- else has a chance to recover from that, including Koskinen himself. And a very frustrating. Well, moment. especially when you jam your stick inside your own net instead of above the goal line where it generally belongs. He's not. He's a big goalie. Yeah. Let's just say that he's a big goalie. He's not the most nimble goalie, uh, but he he's big. All right. Well, he's big enough that he should have made the save even after all that. In terms of where that agree, shot Bruce. went, it just kind of, like I say, it just kind of leaked right through him somehow, yeah. between his arm and his body or some hole. That... I think he was panicked, just you know, like a yeah. little bit panicked, as people are when they make a turnover. Usually, usually when someone makes a turnover like that, it's not like they recover and make a great play. Usually, they make another. They compound it by making another bad play. Even at the NHL level, so uh, I, again, I—that's what I saw. I, I'm not sure if he was panicked. We don't know what his inner mental state was. No, Bruce, my just, bad. Th- Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Just the body language tells you that his reaction was one that looked like of shame, you know, overreaction, if not panic. Yeah. My bad thing, Bruce, was a, a, a tact. I think it's a tactical thing, although I haven't seen this before, so maybe it was a positional thing by different players. But twice, Bruce, in the third period, it broke my heart. Marner gets it on the stick once on the right half wall. Matthews on the left half wall. And the Oilers just let the Red Sea part, and these guys skate right, toward, right down uh, towards the goalie. No one coming out to get them. It was Nugent Nurse the first time, and then the second time it was Caleb Jones. And, like, maybe with your average NHL shooter, that strategy might work. Like, they're not going to... But if you're letting Mitch Marner or Austin Matthews tee it up with that much amount of time and space to shoot, it's just bad things are going to happen. It's like if you let... Then there's other players, too, like if El- Elias Peterson from Vancouver... Mm-hmm. had that opportunity there's just certain players you are asking for trouble and the fact that the orders didn't get on there like jones could have easily to me it looked like get in the shooting lane yeah. he, had, he had all kinds of time what was the idea to let, give the sh- give the goalie a clear view of the puck or something now is a different strategy so so i don't know what the strategy was but i'm thinking it happened twice in a row and i'm thinking it was they're doing something there that you I think you have to be a bit more aggressive. I know it's really important to cover the slot and to cover that off, but this isn't going to work. Um, letting players like that come in to sh- give time and space to shoot the puck like that. And um, so that's my bad thing. Your number. Yeah, I'm going to go with the number one which is the total number of shots on goal fired by the Edmonton Oilers first line of uh, Connor McDavid, zero shots, Ryan Nugent Hopkins, zero shots, in 26 and 28 minutes, respectively, including 10 minutes on the power play for each man, zero shots. And yes, a Pooley Arby, who had a more modest ice time of 1946, which is a lot, maybe a career high even for Jesse, he had one shot. So the whole line... One shot on net. One shot. So, I mean, McDavid made a couple passes on the power play. Obviously, he got assists on the two goals. Made a couple other passes that, you know, set up play, but they couldn't get the puck on the net when they had those chances. Or So, just wasn't clicking for that line. And for all the ice time they played, 
Uh, I mean, let's say 28 minutes and four seconds for Ryan Nugent Hopkins. That's just a few seconds off his career high in that memorable Dallas Aikens game in uh, 2013. And it was um, Nugent's first game in six months. Uh, I will long remember that game. Uh, anyway, this time uh, he played 28 minutes, but uh, pretty quiet 28 minutes. Let's put it that way. They're four and ten since they broke up the dynamite line, Bruce. Four wins and ten losses, I think. Three and six, uh, yeah. one and yeah, three, and right. zero and one. That's four right. and ten. You know what? I think we've I think the we've tried this. Mm-hmm. The verdict's in. This isn't working. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe it's time. Maybe there's some veteran players with really big reputations. <laughs> uh, hey, cat, who? Who need to have a talk with the, the coach needs to have a talk with them and say we're going to try something else guys and you're going to have to suck it up for the team if you don't like the new formation maybe it's Tyson Berry sitting out for Bouchard maybe it's a talk with some of the veteran forwards the top forwards on the team saying listen you're, we're just trying different line mates with you you might not like it but we're doing that and I don't know that for sure the dynamic of what's going on but I can't think of any other reasons why you'd be sticking with something that doesn't work so long other than there's strong inertia uh, reasons for not not doing it, just not seeing any um, chemistry. The Pulleyarvi when Pulleyarvi was moved up, there was the one game, but since the two games since then, you know, um, that ain't that's not particularly working. Pulleyarvi's playing well enough, but um, I'm not loving it. Well, the third line had 11 shots in this game. One for Turris, six for Neil, four for Cassian. And they had, I mean, other than Neil, who had a little bit of time on the power play, and not, not a huge amount, but uh, over four minutes. The Oilers as a team had over 10. Uh, the refs were calling ticky-tack both ways tonight. Uh, anyways, it was uh, the third line got 11 shots, and the first line in much more ice time and way more power play time got one. You know what oh. burns me, Bruce? They they call those this like the little they, they call the taps on the stick, which is fine if you're gonna you know just don't do it, right? Oh, Learn to not to do. Oh. I know it's just it just seems a little bit odd, like. Both ways. But Bruce, they allow it like a player to start the year. Caleb Jones got a penalty because the other team dumped it in and he blocked their body for a second. Right. And they called it. That was rampant all night long, blocking people's bodies after they dumped it in. The owners were. I mean, I didn't notice the. The Oilers doing it to the Leafs because I'm probably by it. You know, I've got my Oilers goggles on. But the Leafs were doing it to the Oilers constantly. And there was no penalties all night long. So, ah, I guess you got to know what the flavor of the day is and don't do it because. Um, flavor of the day was Tiki Tack. Tiki Tack. Tiki Tack ice cream. Very bitter. Very bitter dessert. Bitter, bitter way to end your meal. All right. Uh, my number, Bruce, is. Point eight nine five. That's Miko Koskinen's Koskinen's save percentage uh, of goalies who have played at least four games this season. He ranks twenty sixth in save percentage. So he's one of the worst starting goalies in the NHL this year. Um, you know there hasn't there hasn't been a ton of like screamingly horrible goals like the first goal was tonight. Mm -hmm. But there hasn't been enough big saves. There hasn't been enough big saves. And he's not winning games for his team right now. And um, he lost that game for his team. Um, You know, he was one of the reasons they lost that game tonight. So you can, I guess, put it all in on him, but it's Ken Holland also, right? Ken Holland also has some blame there. He didn't get, make the right bet on a, in the off season on a backup goalie. Uh, you could say, well, it's bad luck. Smith's in, injured. Anyone could get injured, but we all know that the older you are 39 years old, whatever, 38, 39, the older you are, the more likely you are to get injured. He was injured last year and had a bad spell. Yeah, I never missed any time though. I think maybe one game that, uh, yeah. Skinner backed up last year, but, uh, you know, he's played over 40 games in each of the last two. Well, he's on pace for over 40, I guess, last year. He's played basically half or a little more of half of his team's games the last two years. And to disappear without even facing a shot this year, I mean, nobody could have called that. No, and, that's uh, that's true. 
the Oilers could use a nice dose of Mike Smith right about now. I mean, people are going to hate to hear me say that. But well, the team needs a kick in the butt. And I think that's one thing Mike Smith actually delivers, you know, when you have this disorganized defense and stuff. That uh, a little bit of communication from the back end and a little tough love. And I don't know, I'm, not, I'm just not seeing the team spirit right now. If I seem dispirited, that's a big part of it. It's, you know, it's, it's just something lacking with the, with the chemistry right now. You do seem dispirited, Bruce. You do seem dispirited, yes. Which is fine. I get I'm it. doing the game grades again tonight. The last time I graded a win by the Oilers was March the 7th. Coming up on a calendar year. So Bruce, what would you do differently next game? What would, what moves would you make? Kurt to do, <laughs> do get Kurt to do the game grades. Hey, didn't did I have a win? I think. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah you That's right. One. I'm doing the next one, so I'm I'm yeah. I'm. Let's, yeah. let's, other than that, this it's not your. Well, fault. I don't know. First, like it's surviving not your this fault. Surviving. Oh, I know that, and I'm not superstitious. I'm just sick of writing about losses. Okay. Uh, when uh, uh, I mean they've got three more games in the next four days. They play Toronto again on Saturday night. Then they play Ottawa on Sunday night. Ottawa is a seven-game losing streak, but they're oh, resting. Right. They're resting from tonight until Sunday. And the Oilers play Saturday and come back again Sunday with their the back-to-back after this long stretch of games. And then again Tuesday. So they'll have played 12 games in the first 21 days. And that's a tough stretch at any time. But when you got one goalie, you know, they're like, going to have to play Grossneck one game. Or Skinner. On, on oh. Probably game, a Sunday against Ottawa, I would think one of those two guys is going to play, and it's probably going to be Skinner just because he's been here and been with the team. Maybe you're right, Bruce. I wouldn't I just play met Skinner. Grossnick this morning. <laughs> I know. Skinner. I saw We saw Skinner play last night, last year, Bruce, in the yeah. NHL. He, he is not ready for the NHL. Now, he, that doesn't mean he couldn't come up with the, you know, some great game. He did that at the AHL level too, but come on, he's like an 890. What was his save percentage in the AHL last year? He wasn't close to the NHL quality. So I, I would go with Grossnick if he's, if he's at all sharp and ready to go, I would, he's a, he, well, he hasn't played since last March either. Right. I know. I still, <laughs> I'm just not as, it's, uh, I'm not it's, as uh, it's a bad believer. situation is what I'm saying. You know, before Mike Smith gets back or they come up with some other, idea of what they're doing they're running with one goalie and uh uh Koskinen I think one thing we've seen over the three years that he's been here is that he's better as a as a two games out of three goalie than he is an every night guy and showed a little bit tonight with a couple of old uh, one real bad one Frankly, I wasn't thrilled with the winner by Matthews. Like, it went right through him as well. Yeah. A hard shot, but the big hole was there, and he hit it. Yeah, it could. it's arguably a B chance. Like, it's arguably A, B. Like, it's on the cusp because of who was shooting it. I would say Matthew, Matthews, 25% of the time, is going to score from that spot with that time and space. So, I say it's an A. I guess, yeah. But you can, you can, that's up for debate. Oh. The whole cost in this game is make himself big and give the guy nothing to shoot at. And there was a big gaping hole under his arm, and he hit it. So, great shot. I mean, yeah. he's, a, he's a wicked shooter. I would reunite the dynamite line for the umpteenth time. I would put Cahoon with McDavid and pull the RV. If Haas is ready to play, I would put him into he's the not. lineup. He's not a. Um, and um, I, I would put Bouchard in for Barry. So. Those are the moves. And and with a goalie, I would go with Grossnick over Skinner. Uh, if Grossnick is at all game ready or... Well, let's see if. I close. mean, that's what we don't know. I'm speculating that Skinner might be closer to being ready for playing behind the Edmonton Oilers than is Troy Grossnick that uh, met the team this morning. I'm and, and the I, game on Sunday. And I was putting him in, even though I couldn't really remember his first name. <laughs> There you go. In the moment. But you know, uh, times are desperate when. Gross, yeah. Nick. Hey, Get in hey, there, stopper. You over there. <laughs> you on the goalie pads. No, the little guy in the goalie pads, not the big guy. You're in that tonight. All right. All right, Bruce. Uh, I was, I'm a little less dispirited because 
the, the Oilers have been outchancing teams a little bit. They haven't been generally, except for the Montreal games, they've been really in every game. They came back, they came back in this game, and I was really encouraged by that. The third line played okay. And I do think with a few lineup tweaks that this team could really go on a run. Like, and I don't know if the coach is going to do that or if there's some, something in, something that prevents them from doing that. But I, I do think this team can turn it around. So I, I'm not yet in um, – I'm not disconsolate. They already need to go on a run because they're four points out of fourth place and two of the teams ahead of them have two games in hand. And you might say, well, it's early in the season, but we're already at the point where there's, you know, 40-odd games left. And it's like being at the middle middle of a season. They gotta win. They gotta win like eight out of ten games here, Bruce. Win they gotta go on a run. Games. Yeah, they gotta. They gotta start winning or get some loser points. Even like yeah. well, that would have been nice. I was hoping that's what was. As soon as Cassian tied it, I'm like, I had on my loser point hat and thinking, let's let's at least get that. Get the one and then get the second one in overtime and then you know and the, I mean you get some kind of result like the six regulation losses out of nine. That's I mean the way the NHL this system is designed to punish teams that lose in regulation far more than they reward teams that win in regulation, like Edmonton did in all of their wins. Uh, and the teams that play the three-point games are the ones that get rewarded. Well, so far, that's not Edmonton. They haven't played one game like that. So It's interesting. I see the orders have matched up okay with every team they've played. Uh, I, I haven't seen them. I don't think the Leafs are a better team than the orders from what I've seen in the games. I don't think the Jets are, and I don't think Vancouver is, but I do think Montreal is. So... That's another reason I'm kind of encouraged. We'll see with how they match up against Calgary. That's yet to be seen. And we don't know how they're going to match up even against Ottawa. Because some teams, the orders play a little better against than others. So we'll see if Ottawa will have their number or not. They they better not because that would be a disaster. Well, Winnipeg and Vancouver both just completed three-game sweeps against the Senators. So, aye, aye, you know, aye. like they're a poor club, but they're going to come in here on Sunday a little bit rested and loaded for bear and trying to take advantage of a of a team, you know, that played the night before that may be a bit down in the dumps. And it's a trap game. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about, well, frankly, both games on the weekend. Fair enough, Bruce. Fair enough. All right. Hard to be optimistic about much right, right at the moment, is it? Well, I'm, I'm still optimistic, so well, I'm good for I, you. Yeah, hopefully you're optimistic enough for both of us because I'm not feeling it right now. Where it may have entitled. shone through on this podcast. Sorry, folks. It's 2021. We are all now entitled to our own feelings, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Thanks for talking tonight, Bruce. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. And there you are, smiling. That's good. All right. See you later. My cat came to visit. That was nice. That was nice. <laughs> And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey Podcast.